Um, uh, but does anyone know how, what qualifies a joke as a dad joke? It's where the punchline is apparent. Huh? <laughs> although, although uh, my daughter here, whenever I ask her that question, she says, uh, when it's not funny. Uh, uh, by the way, that daughter, uh, that picture was taken when we first started Webflow. That's her a weekend ago. So time flies. Enjoy those moments with your kids if you have them. Uh, oh, actually, before I jump into that, look at that for a second. I don't know if anybody has addressed this massive W here, uh, which I think looks bigger when I stand next to it because I'm a tiny person. Um, but it stands for Webflow, period. <laughs> so just, just uh, keep that in your mind. So I want to tell you a couple of stories today. One is uh, about this guy who happens to be my brother. His name is Sergi. And these are two llamas. Um, I don't know if I'm being like politically incorrect by not using their real names. Uh, I just didn't have time to look those up. Um, but Sergi is a designer. And he grew up as a photographer, then became a designer, worked at a skate shop. And one day, many, many years ago, about eight years ago, he sent me this email. He's like, hey, help me pick this logo. And most importantly, don't forward it to anyone, in all caps. Um, and he had this idea for uh, a company called Help Riot to find people in need, things like causes and uh, problems that people were having that, that he wanted to fund, he wanted to get it off the ground, he wanted to get people rallied around them, almost like a Kickstarter for social good. So he had this idea, he uh, started developing it over several months, started reaching out to a lot more people, then made this massive design. He designed the entire the flow of the software. By the way, Sergi's in this room somewhere. I don't know where he is, but say hi if you see him. Oh, right there. Uh, <laughs> so he designed this, this whole thing. As you can see, he's a pretty decent designer. Um, he, he thought through the entire software flow. He thought how like these campaigns were going to run, how he's going to recruit people. And at the end of the day, this didn't get that far, because he couldn't find a developer to make that into reality. And I kind of uh, thought of like, oh, what would Sergi's like, state of mind be during that time, being so, so frustrated that he created something so big, but then couldn't actually make it happen? So I Googled uh, scruffy, frustrated designer with, uh, with glasses on, and I came up with this. I know it doesn't look like Sergi. Um, which, which actually, then I sort of zoomed in, and, and it says, young bearded graphic designer, laptop looking sad, worried, absolutely empty. <laughs> which, which is kind of funny, uh, until I looked under the picture. Um, and it says, laptop looking sad and worried, absolutely empty-handed, broke, in sheer bankruptcy, penniless, <laughs> feeling poor and frustrated. So whoever's writing these captions, A, proves that machine language has a lot of room to grow, because nobody can come up with these. And this person has probably been a freelancer. Uh, and this is a pretty common story. Ever since the invention of the web, which has now been over 30, 30 years ago, the story of how people build things uh, for the internet is, has been like this, um, this journey that's always dependent on writing code. From the very first website that Tim Berners-Lee created, which was for CERN, to sites like this. I don't know if this triggers anyone's like table layout, uh, bad memories. Um, to the pinnacle of web design, uh, which we sort of hit a few years ago, where everything looked like this. <laughs> to some of the, like, the, the most amazing sites uh, that we see today, where there's tons of interaction, uh, tons of animation, a lot of uh, storytelling, some of the things that Matt showed uh, that, that basic agency was working on where you have these, these rich experiences and, and, and stories that you're telling. And all of this right now happens with code. And it started sort of in the, in the Dreamweaver days. Again, sorry to trigger uh, uh, anyone who's, who's been at this from the 90s. Um, but the, the story has been like you use a tool to write code, and then you see the output. And it first started with HTML and CSS. Um, and actually, for some people who started way early in the 90s, it was just HTML. We were styling everything in like tags, and CSS didn't exist yet. And then over time, more and more of these technologies sort of like added on, 
like the kinds of things you needed to know to make a basic website. So it kind of went to JavaScript, then we had jQuery and SAS and WordPress and less, um, Git. You know, you had to figure more of these things out. And before you know it, more and more of these things piled up that you really needed to learn to, to, to practice the skill, to be in this industry, to do web design. And I'm not even done here. I can kind of keep going. Um, and, and now we have like cheat sheets for HTML. We have like cheat sheets for CSS and, and uh, JavaScript. Uh, we even have cheat sheets for like specific technologies inside of CSS. So we have this massive like Flexbox, Flexbox cheat sheet that's so big that somebody created a cheat sheet for the cheat sheet, <laughs> which is a whole lot of cheating happening. Um, so right now, if you want to practice web design, you have to learn all of these technologies that you know, 20 years ago barely existed. And a lot of uh, veterans in the industry are like, well, I was able to learn, uh, therefore, you can learn this stuff. Kind of forgetting the fact that, that for people who have been in this, in this industry for a long time, we were sort of like able to learn incrementally um, and not all at once. And to add to that, we have like a bazillion devices with like retinas, not retinas, uh, Android, iOS, et cetera, where it's just like completely overwhelming. And now we have the Jamstack. I don't know if anybody's uh, heard of that, but it's supposedly uh, you know, solving this problem. But yet, it's adding more and more tools that we have to learn and know how to like, glue together uh, to make these things happen. So being a web developer or a web designer is like, ugh, what am I getting myself into? It sort of started pretty easy, but now if you're getting into to this industry now, it's pretty overwhelming. And some of the tools that, that veterans had way back in the day to learn and to, to practice this stuff don't exist anymore. Like, if you go view source on a website, all you see right now is a bunch of minified code, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You really can't make sense of it anymore. Um, it's all kind of like hidden and, and compiled to where, you know, it's just like a block of text. So going into web design, it's just like, all right, uh, am, I, am I like taking on a four-year university class here? And the main thing that I think is holding web design back is this reliance on this bimodal representation of what we're doing. Almost everything, if you go through the awards uh, site, like the sites of the day, the sites of the month, sites of the year, almost all of them are developed in this way where you look at a code uh, editor on one side of the screen, and you look at what you're actually uh, creating on the other side of the screen. So there's, you know, we have some tools to like live reload and things like that, but you're still creating in one place and then seeing if uh, what you want to exist is what you actually meant. Um, and, and for a lot of people, it's just like hieroglyphics. It's, it's, it's a foreign language. Um, so much so that only one out of every 400 people, so imagine there's 400 people in this room. There's actually 1,000. Uh, and only one out of 400. So if, if we were to count all of us here, and I know we're kind of in a little uh, tech bubble here, but out of all the people in this room, if we were to make this room representative of, of the people in all of Earth, two and a half people in this room would be able to code up a website. I don't know who the half person is, but um, that, that'll be interesting. And, which translates to 0.25% of all people on Earth, which is like, a tiny number, right? We talk about the 1%. This is like a quarter of 1%. And if you imagine, like, what if, what if only a quarter of 1%, what if everybody, almost everyone, was able to read, but only a quarter of 1% was able to write, like, a novel or a book or an essay or something like that? That's kind of where we find ourselves right now in, in making something meaningful for the web, something, like, creative and custom that's not just, like, a template and moving things around. And again, we're sort of back to this bimodal representation of, of what we're trying to create. But what if we were able to actually like move that into one way of thinking? Um, what if it was represented the same way where we represent other things, like graphic design? And why, why this is important is because even people who have been in the industry for like 20 years are now finding themselves completely overwhelmed at the complexity. Like even if you have been coding HTML and CSS and JavaScript for, for many decades, sometimes it can feel like if you go on vacation or you go like three months uh, not participating in the industry, you're completely behind. Because now there's framework XYZ and React and Vue and Angular and et cetera. Actually, not Angular. Um, Sorry, anyone who uses Angular. <laughs> um, but it's just like moving so fast. So even like the people who are speaking on stages, like showing um, like the, 
best of breed techniques, they're feeling overwhelmed. Um, Jen Simmons, who's one of the leading people in the CSS like layout space, she's, she's been behind like Flexbox and CSS Grid. Like she's saying people who invented this industry feel um, behind. So I believe what we really need is what other creative industries have really taken advantage of. And this is um, this, this concept of having a direct connection to the medium that you're creating for. And this is so natural to how we behave and how we create as people. Um, it, from, the, from the very time that we started like painting stuff on, on caves, like we didn't, we didn't like look around and tell like, you know, Jim, I don't know what caveman names were, like, hey, draw this, or this is what I want uh, this thing to look like. We directly manipulated the, the surface that we wanted to leave an impression on. Uh, through the Renaissance, like playing music, we don't, we don't uh, even though sometimes we use software design tools to sort of like visualize music, we're, we still need this direct connection to the thing that we're creating. Uh, this immediate response without having to, uh, you know, like think our intent and then see maybe if that's what we meant or not. So in, in just the way that we create for movies, the way that we sketch, the way that, that we sculpt, um, the way that we you know, make furniture and, and gifts, and uh, the way that kids play with, with Play-Doh and um, like what, what they do in kindergarten, even before kindergarten, there's like this direct connection to the thing that they're creating. Um, it's sort of, if you think of Michelangelo, he's not like uh, saying, I need to chisel here. He literally goes and chisels like where he wants to see like a different muscle take shape. And we've seen this, this concept applied in many, many different creative spheres where, uh, you know, people who work on animation, uh, work on games, uh, work on 3D modeling, um, there, there are a lot, of <laughs> a lot of concepts where we're just like trying to recreate this, this direct manipulation uh, idea in, in the software that we're using to express these ideas, make these movies, etc. Uh, and now we're, we're doing this in like 3D space. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you have tried like painting in VR. It's amazing uh, because you don't have to have this like bimodal conversation with yourself. Is, is this what I mean or is this what I'm creating? So we've created all these, all these amazing tools. And as I've gone through them, um, you know, through the, the print design industry, the 3D animation uh, industry, um, the game industry, uh, I sort of like started taking a bunch of screenshots um, and, and actually put them in alphabetical order here by discipline. So indulge me for a second. Um, so first we have a 3D animator. Um, you know, pretty straightforward. They, they work directly with the models that they're animating or, or that they're modeling. Um, same thing with modelers. Same thing with, um, can't read that here, like people who are coloring movies. Um, Whenever you're editing photos or creating illustrations or designing a game level uh, or designing particle effects, like you're not thinking through a code base. You're thinking through you know, particle emitters and gravity wells and, and how things uh, react based on like, this visual workflow that you're creating. You know, when you're a photographer or you're creating a magazine, um, you're, you're working on a um, you know, very, very complicated texture, uh, you're doing video editing or, or like you're creating effects for these amazing movies. All of these things are, are just like directly accessible to, to the artist. Um, they're, they're creating it, they're pressing a button, it goes live. And yet, this is a web designer. I mean, come on. <laughs> Uh, and it's cut off because of CSS. Uh, <laughs> and as an industry, we're like, okay, this is, uh, this is normal. I guess this is just how we do things. Um, or at least that's what it seems like. It's sort of the, the people in this room, the people practicing um, high-level design and like, the people working in agencies, big product shops, uh, even uh, like, web design freelancers, we, we're sort of resigned to the fact that like, this is how it is. Um, but I think that's one of the most dangerous things, is, is just to assume that this is the best way to do things. And Brett Victor, who is one of the pioneers in, um, in the direct ma manipulation space, um, he just says, like, when you, do, when you make the assumption that um, this is the best way we can do things, you, you become blind to a whole range of possibilities. But what, what if we were to imagine a way to take that one person that's in a room of 400 and turn that into four people, 
uh, maybe 40 people. Like that'll be already be more than a 10x improvement. How can we get people to participate in this industry and create these amazing things um, without this huge barrier of having to rely on code? So that's actually the entire uh, mission of Webflow. Like when Sergi had this um, experience of, of imagining something but not being able to uh, move it into production, make it real, uh, which by the way, does anybody else think <laughs> that Sir Patrick Stewart is almost as good looking as Sergi? What do you think? Um, so we just, we just said, both of us and uh, our co-founder Brian, we just said like, we want to make this real. Like the best way for us to know like what the future is going to hold is to try to invent it. And we just said, what, what would it take to do what Sergi wanted to do without having any code? And we created a direct manipulation experience exactly for the web, respecting the principles of the web, respecting the box model, respecting how uh, CSS works, respecting how, is that playing? That's supposed to be a video. Um, respecting how developers are actually um, pulling data from a live database and, and creating things that are CMS powered or have user systems or the, the real world types of websites and applications. And how do we make those happen without requiring this massive, massive burden uh, of having somebody learn how to code? And what that has led to is so many people creating these really, really rich experiences down to entire products. And we were actually able to do that in a way where people have access again to things like view source, where not only can they view source, they can actually see exactly how an application or an animation or uh, a set of, um, like an experience was built from the ground up. You can see all the DOM nodes. You can see all the CSS animations. You can see all the, um, the way that the abstract JavaScript is put together and how, how all these things happen um, the kinds of sites that Matt showed where as, you, as you're scrolling, like a story is being told. Like people can now do these things um, with a direct manipulation um, experience. And why does this matter? Um, because right now, even though it's 30 years after the invention of the internet, it is literally just the beginning. Um, I know we're kind of in our own, you know, US, maybe European, like well-developed countries bubble. Um, but the internet is just now starting to get wide penetration. Not, like barely half of the world uh, has access to the internet. A lot of people have much slower access to the internet than, than we experience it here. So it's not even the same internet that, that they're experiencing, experiencing as we are. Um, and let's see if that's playing. Uh, as you can see here, like some of the mo more developed countries are starting to get wide internet adoption, but so much of the world still hasn't had that. And as we think about how people access this sort of power, the power of software development, the power of um, web design, the power of building something for the internet, what we have to remember is the remainder of the world doesn't have the same type of access that we do. For example, over the last 30 years, all these like resources for learning how to program, learning how to do web design, they're almost exclusively in English. They're almost exclusively, even for people who speak English, they're hard to understand um, and hard to really like start a new career without like a boot camp or something like that. Um, so as, we, as the internet starts to expand into other countries where other people want to uh, develop these skills and actually create valuable things, they actually don't have access to everything that we have access to. And there's this quote um, that talent is equally distributed. There's talent everywhere, but the opportunity to do something with that talent actually isn't. And that's what we're trying to, that we, we have to somehow distribute that opportunity. Otherwise, the internet is going to remain Western centric, English centric, et cetera. And if we think about this, 0.25% of the world that currently has that power, probably most of us in this room, whether through like our own skills or, or through the companies where we work or through the teams that we have access to. How do you think about that? Like today, there's 200 million active websites out of 100, like 1.2 billion like total websites. Um, the vast majority of those are parked, but 200 million active websites. How are we going to get to a billion with with this percentage staying relatively flat. Over the last 30 years, this has not moved that much. 
even with code.org and all the ways that we're trying to teach our kids to code and trying to teach code in you know, middle school and high school and college, like this needle isn't moving. So are we going to empower more of the world to create the things that we create, that the kinds of things that we're already used to, and we've seen the social impact of, the, the economic impact of, are we going to keep this, this power to, uh, to create to ourselves? Like we always talk about accessibility you know, in terms of like, consuming something, about like, making our you know, alt tags accessible or, or um, making sure our websites are um, usable in a screen reader. But we talk very little about the accessibility to create for the web. And the question for all of you is, do you actually imagine that, that the next billion websites will be built in this language that people just don't inherently connect to? It's still hieroglyphics to most people. All the tools that are proliferating, you know, two years from now, it's probably like this slide is probably going to look, uh, you know, 10 times as big. Or is it more likely that people can uh, have this sort of impact and create these sort of sorts of things if we, if we follow the footsteps of all these other creative disciplines and create the types of tooling, and it doesn't have to be Webflow, it could be a, a thousand companies, um, to create the types of tooling that gives people access to this amazing, empowering new medium that we created. And just to drive the point home, I want to introduce you to Matt, Brett, and Ali. And they started out almost exactly at the same time that Sergi did with a similar mission. They actually had a chance to visit Haiti after the, um, I'm not sure why it's not playing. Imagine a very dramatic and emotional video in the background. <laughs> Hold on, let me see, because this is kind of important. Um, they, they had a chance to visit Haiti after a massive disaster. And they saw that the majority of the population was living in temporary housing. Like they had, they had these, these, these tents and um, nobody had a place that they could actually call home. And they were so driven by this, similar to Sergi, so driven by this mission that they wanted to solve that problem. Which, by the way, the scope of that problem is immense. By 2050, it's estimated that 3 billion people will not have stable housing. So Matt and Brett and Ali, they um, were actually able to create this sort of fake Kickstarter. Um, and they were able to do that with Webflow to sort of, and, and it was all fake, where it wasn't an actual piece of software, but they, they would actually take a form submission and log in every 30 minutes to like update the bar, the div, that, that uh, shows like the total number of uh, submissions. And they were actually able to, to fund like 10 families that way. That gave them enough energy to say, hey, there's something here. And at the time, they were working, like Matt was working as a designer, as a part-time designer in Georgia. Um, and he wasn't even sure he wanted to like, devote his entire life to this. But being able to create something, get it out in the world, gave him this, this power to actually say, yes, I can do that. I don't need um, this like, gatekeeper or anything else to like, drive this, uh, see if that's playing, uh, to actually make this happen. And, and since then, they've impacted more than 10,000 families. They've built over 2,000 homes across four countries. They're now 3D printing houses. Uh, in, they're, they're going to be going mass scale with these houses that, that cost only $5,000 to develop. And they're putting them in, in Haiti, in Mexico, in El Salvador, and they're going to be expanding in more than 10 countries. And maybe just because they were able to validate that idea and, and get it out into the world. And now there's tens of thousands of people who are creating things like this. They're now, the, the revolution is starting, um, where they're, they're now starting to believe that they have the power to take advantage of the power of the internet and, and get their products and ideas and, and content and entertainment out there. Sorry, I'm kind of confused here. Uh, and the cool thing about this is that websites are just such a small sliver away from software. Like when we look at New Story Charity, um, Matt's uh, charity, like it started with a simple website and then it expanded into an entire application. All you ha really have to do is add like user systems or the ability to log in and all of a sudden you have an entire product. All of a sudden people can create things like a new Twitter or the next Airbnb, etc. cetera. And, and the most demotivating thing for, for these people who are now learning this new skill is to talk to a 
real developer or real web designer and have those people tell them, oh, that's cute. Like, you're using a drag and drop tool or something like that. Um, it's not real. And imagine the impact that our voices can have as the founders of an industry, people, the people who have seen the power that our products and our tools and our, uh, our sites can, can have on others. And imagine, instead of saying, like, oh, that's not real, imagine encouraging them and, and seeing 10 times, if not 100 times as many people participate in the kinds of things that, that we know that are fundamentally empowering for others. So I just want to call you all to just imagine a world where a lot more people are participating in, in creating the kinds of sites and software and the kinds of things that tangibly improve people's lives, because that can lead to more businesses, more solutions, more economies like growing where, where they're not growing today. And that could be, be a huge, huge improvement to the world. Thank you.